There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Twisted Philly. It's 2017, a new year, opportunities for new adventures, new hopes and dreams, and lots of new stories to share. I have a new partnership to announce. There's a musician whom I have been a huge fan of for a number of years, a singer-songwriter from New England named Emmy Sarah. Emmy has graciously shared some of her brilliant, haunting, beautiful songs with me for Twisted Philly. So throughout this and other episodes, you'll get to hear Emmy's music. And this is just a tease. Trust me when I tell you, you'll want to listen more. You can find out about Emmy and her music at emmysera.com. That's E-M-M-Y-C-E-R-R-A dot com. And you can download her albums on iTunes. If you're listening to Twisted Philly in New England, be sure to go to her website for information about upcoming gigs in your area. I met Emmy about six years ago when we worked together, and instantly I knew she was a special soul, someone with such depth and beauty inside and out, and her music absolutely conveys that beautiful depth. We're going to start this episode, as we always do, with some what-ups. We picked up a few more reviews on iTunes. What up to Brianna from the Murder Dictionary podcast. Thank you so much for listening and taking the time to leave a review. I am loving your show. There have been a couple of times when I'm driving to work listening and I feel like I need to pull over because I am laughing so hard. I've heard so many great things about the Murder Dictionary podcast and they're all true. So Twisters, show them some love. What up, Ari Cyan? Thanks for taking the time to leave a review. I love chatting with you on Facebook and thanks for listening. And what up to R. Statton, or Randy, who has been trucking for 30 years, and in that time, Randy hasn't found much to like about Philly other than the sandwiches, which I can only assume means cheesesteaks. But then Randy found Twisted Philly and found something to like about our fair city. Thanks for calling me sassy and brassy, Randy. That's awesome. And you're right. Sometimes this city can be mean. Our sports fans can be mean, and some of our crime stories are mean as hell. That's the thing about Philly. It's the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, and sometimes we don't demonstrate either of those traits. There's so much to love about Philadelphia, and I do love this city of mine, yet it sometimes leaves me in tears. And this couldn't be more true than in this week's episode about two of Philadelphia's unknown children. I know cities all over the world have cold cases, cases of unidentified victims, Jane and John Doe's. Sometimes these cases remain unsolved, and then sometimes after years of unrelenting efforts by police and public, victims are identified. In the case of children, these stories are that much harder, at least for me, because we're supposed to protect children. Not merely our own, but everyone's children. And for two little souls in Philadelphia, protection was what they needed but never received. In May 1994, I was almost 25 years old. I was moving up the corporate ladder one rung at a time, building my career. I was still listening to Duran Duran, as I was 10 years before that, and as I still do 20 years later, I had a cute little apartment in Delaware County with a cat and a full set of dishes and silverware, which if you lived on your own in your early 20s, full sets of dishes and silverware made you feel so grown up. One day late in the month, just around or after Memorial Day, I remember seeing a story in the news about a little boy who was found dead in a duffel bag. He was called the boy in the bag. I couldn't believe what I'd heard, 
he was thought to be between four and six years old. Who could possibly do something like that? How could someone kill a child and dump them like trash? His body was found in a lot in Old City on North Lawrence Street under the Ben Franklin Bridge. Old City is exactly what it sounds like. It's one of, if not the oldest sections in the city of Philadelphia. It has the oldest inhabited street in the country. That's Alfred's Alley. You can find the Liberty Bell nearby and Independence Hall. It's a beautiful, well-maintained part of Philadelphia. So finding an abandoned child shoved in a duffel bag is shocking. This little boy was found on May 27th by construction workers who were working nearby. His body had come out of the bag and stories ranged from it had been dragged out by stray dogs or city workers were using strong hoses and jostled the bag, but a Graco duffel bag was found nearby. And he'd probably been there for months. His body was so badly decomposed that police couldn't tell his age other than he was young, nor could they tell his race or ethnicity. They couldn't distinguish anything about this little boy in a bag other than he was a little boy who was alone and forgotten. After the autopsy, an artist was brought in to create a sculptural reconstruction of what this little boy may have looked like. And that's what I remember from 1994 and 1995 about the boy in the bag. The sculpture of this beautiful little African-American boy, what he might have looked like in life. Police tried to determine his identity through dental records, but they came up empty, so this little guy had never been to a dentist, or at least not in Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. There were no records that matched his dental remains. The summer that he was found, flyers went up all over the city, and the local news made pleas for anyone who may have any information about this little boy, anyone who lost a child, or anyone who may have known of an abused child, because even after what the elements did to his little body out in that vacant lot for months, the autopsy revealed he'd been beaten recently and over a period of years, and he was only four or six years old at the time of his death. What could a little guy like that have possibly done to deserve repeated beatings that eventually led to his death and abandonment wrapped in sheets and a child's blanket and tossed away in a duffel bag? As this story spread, we learned that neighbors on Lawrence Street had actually seen the bag in the lot for months, but they didn't think much of it. I mean, who's going to go into a vacant lot and investigate a duffel bag that just appears one day? In September 1994, the Philadelphia police enlisted the help of a crime show that was premiering that month. It was Sightings. Anybody besides me remember that show? The boy in the bag and the artist who created the sculptural reconstruction was profiled on the premiere episode, although this story was a bit different than the usual fare from Sightings that really focused on paranormal and supernatural occurrences. And even with that national awareness, no one came forward. No one claimed this little boy. No one reported a missing child. No one called the police with suspicions about a missing child or child endangerment. The months following his discovery stretched into years. All the while, the body of this little abandoned soul stayed at the Philadelphia city morgue. Over the years, one Philadelphia resident kept watch over the little boy, and that was a woman named Mary Peck. She called the police every year asking if they'd made any headway in learning who this little boy was or who had killed him. And eventually, the nature of her calls shifted from inquiries to requests. Could this little boy be put to rest? Mary was 70 years old at the time, and she was a member of St. Malachi's Roman Catholic Church. She had talked to her parish priest, and the reverend and the nuns at St. Malachi's worked with Mary to get a plot donated for this little unknown boy. Finally, in 2001, seven years after his body was found in that vacant lot, Mary was able to retrieve his ashes from the morgue and have this little boy put to rest. Mary and the nuns planned his funeral, and he was buried on Ash Wednesday at the New Cathedral Cemetery with a donated headstone that read, God bless the grave of this unknown boy. He was surrounded by love from Mary Peck and her fellow parishioners, from Philadelphians who cared about the fate of this little unknown child. And Mary Peck, God bless her for her constant care and concern for a little boy that before his death seemed unloved and unwanted. 
So why did it take seven years before his remains could be released? Why did they have to wait so long? That was a question that was foremost in my mind. Well, I learned it's because most hospitals keep x-rays for seven years. And until seven years were up, this little boy was kept, as horrible as this sounds, in a freezer in the event he could be identified. The coroner's office and Philadelphia police homicide detectives were hopeful that at some point this little boy's x-rays would match a hospital somewhere. And by somewhere, I do indeed mean somewhere, because over the years, detectives followed leads across the country, not merely in Philadelphia, but south to the Carolinas, in Chicago, and even on the West Coast in California. The detectives suspected this little boy died at the hands of his parents or a guardian, but with absolutely no way to identify him, there was nowhere to look for his killers. In almost 50 years, there had only been two other cases like this one in Philadelphia, and the first was a child abandoned in Fox Chase in 1956, who many of you may have heard of, and that was the boy in the box. And then there was a little girl abandoned in 1981 who was found in a steamer trunk. Over the years, Philadelphia police continued their search for the identity of the boy found in the bag. Philadelphia news stations continued running stories about him. He wasn't forgotten, but he wasn't exactly found either. Until 10 years later, when a man searching the website for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children stumbled upon a photograph of that sculptural reconstruction of this little boy, and it was a face he recognized. The man who contacted Philadelphia police was this little boy's uncle, and for 10 years, he and other family members questioned Alicia Willis Robinson and her husband Lawrence Robinson about Alicia's son Jarrell Willis, who disappeared. Alicia and Lawrence never answered the family's questions. They dodged their questions, they avoided the subject altogether, or they gave family members some bullshit stories. Jarrell Willis, the boy in the bag, another one of Philadelphia's unknown children, had a name. Jarrell Willis. Jarrell had been just four years old when he was beaten to death by his mother and her husband in their Camden, New Jersey apartment. Alicia Robinson, who was 32 at the time of her arrest in March 2005, admitted that she and her husband repeatedly beat Jarrell in the head during a snowstorm in 1994. He became lethargic, and then he fell unconscious and died from his injuries. Neither one of them called an ambulance. Neither made any attempt to get him help. They stripped him, wrapped him in sheets and blankets, stuffed Jarrell in a nylon duffel bag, and dumped that bag in the first vacant lot they found after crossing the bridge into Philadelphia, by the way, on public transportation. Lawrence Robinson was already behind bars when Alicia was arrested. He was serving time for sexual assault. During the fall before Jarrell's murder, New Jersey DIFUS was contacted, and DIFUS is what we call the Department of Youth and Family Services. They visited the Willis Robinson residence because of four claims over the period of a year of child abuse and neglect. These claims were raised about Jarrell and his siblings. Caseworkers claim they were unable to prove the reports, so the case was closed in October 1993. So what went wrong there, and how is it possible that family members, like grandparents, aunts and uncles, or cousins, or neighbors, or just anyone, someone didn't call the police when they noticed one of Alicia Robinson's children were gone? At the time, when family members were questioned, they said it was hard to keep track of Alicia and her kids. They moved a lot in New Jersey, and then they moved to Philadelphia. So their friends and family weren't sure how to get in touch with Alicia sometimes, nor after a few years did they know how many children she had. And after moving to Philadelphia, there were reports of child neglect there too, but again, nothing could be substantiated, so no action was taken. This woman dodged the system every chance she got to avoid justice, to avoid accountability for the treatment of her children. In April 2005, Alicia Robinson was charged in Philadelphia with abusing a corpse and hindering arrest, and she was charged in New Jersey with first-degree murder, and she was extradited back to Jersey. Lawrence Robinson was also charged with first-degree murder, although during his arraignment, he argued with the judge and the DA, saying that he wasn't even home the day Jarrell was murdered. Yeah, 
Okay, you didn't evade arrest for seven years either before finally being sent to prison for sexual assault charges in 1996. And as sometimes happens in these situations, trials are delayed, appeals are filed, and deals are considered. That's what happened with Alicia Robinson. In 2007, she cut a deal. She pled guilty to hindering prosecution in exchange for the murder charge being dropped and testifying against her husband, Lawrence Robinson, exclusively in the death of her son. She claimed that she didn't actually participate in Jarrell's beating and she wasn't home when it happened. She came home in the afternoon and found Jarrell dead at the hands of her husband. Alicia said she was only guilty of helping Lawrence dispose of the body and then not coming forward when her son was found. I don't know that I believe that story because when Alicia Robinson was first confronted by the police in 2005, she told a very different and participative story in her role of Jarrell's death. Lawrence Robinson's trial was scheduled for 2009, and no matter where I search, and when I tell you I went through an exhaustive and frustrating search, I cannot find any details about Lawrence Robinson's trial, or if he was found guilty of Jarrell's murder, or did they just let him serve out his eight-year sexual assault sentence and call it a day. I don't know. And it pisses me off because you guys know I get down in the weeds sometimes when it comes to research, and I hate leaving something hanging, but for now, at least in the case of Lawrence Robinson, I have to let it go. On July 31st in 2005, a grave blessing was held for Jarrell Willis in New Cathedral Cemetery. Jim Travis of Travis Memorials, the man who donated the original headstone, donated a new one. This time, it was a stone that had Jarrell's name. There are photos of Jarrell's headstone and the bust created by Philadelphia forensic sculptor Frank Bender on my website if you want to take a look. And I wish this was the only case of this sort in Philadelphia, but it isn't. I mentioned earlier in this episode there were two little abandoned souls who desperately needed protection. The first was Jarrell Willis. The second story took place 12 years before the death of Jarrell. And this is the story of Aaliyah Davis. The Girl in the Trunk. In February 1982, two men who worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation were working on the west side of the Platte Bridge, that's a bridge in South Philadelphia, when they found an old steamer trunk that had been dumped under the bridge. Inside the trunk were the decomposed remains of what appeared to be a little girl. She was naked, bound and gagged, and wrapped in plastic before being placed in the trunk. Like the case of the boy in the bag, it was almost impossible to tell when this little girl had been murdered or any other identifying traits. Philadelphia police again called in Frank Bender to create a sculptural reconstruction of this little girl in an effort to identify her, find her family, and find her killer. Now, Frank's work is an art. He started as a professional photographer and eventually escalated, graduated, I don't know what you call it, but he began using his skills to create these sculptural reconstructions of unidentified persons. And from what I read, what he does is he uses the victim's skull, covers it with clay, and then uses scientific and forensic formulas to determine facial thickness as well as his own instincts as an artist to construct a face. Once that's done, there's a plaster mold made and he casts a bust out of plaster or resin. This process is so similar to the steps that special effects makeup artists follow, except our finished products are made from latex or polyfoam and aren't an actual sculpture. When the bust of this little girl was completed, Philadelphia police had the arduous task of trying to identify this beautiful little girl who was thought to be about five years old at the time of her murder. But just like Jarrell Willis, no one came forward. No family, no friends reported a missing child. No neighbors called the police because suddenly a little girl disappeared and wasn't seen out playing on the sidewalk anymore. No teachers reported a missing student to their principals. It would be five more years before this sweet baby girl would be identified, and that was thanks in large part to her older sister. In July 1987, 14-year-old Amira Davis 
told her father that her little sister Aaliyah had been beaten to death by her stepfather five years earlier. Aaliyah's parents were divorced, and it had only been that summer that she and her brother were again given the opportunity to start visiting her father. When he learned of this, Amira's father contacted Philadelphia police, and that began the investigation into Aaliyah's death. Aaliyah Davis. After five years, the little girl in the trunk finally had a name, Aaliyah Davis. Her sister, Amira, gets huge what-ups from this podcaster for finding her courage and her voice to tell someone about what she'd seen. Her little five-year-old sister being beaten with a stick by her stepfather in July 1981. And for anyone out there listening who may be wondering why she didn't say anything sooner, don't even go there. Take a minute and think about this. Amira was just nine when her sister was killed. I can't imagine how terrifying that must have been for her. And as a child, she probably thought the same thing could happen to her if she told anyone. Even at 14, she must have been fearful to speak up, afraid of what would happen to her and her brother Malcolm, who was 11 when Aaliyah was murdered. Both Amira and Malcolm reported multiple beatings over the years at the hands of their mother, Maria Davis Fox, and their stepfather, Charles Fox. In October 1987, both Maria and Charles Fox were charged in Aaliyah's murder, and Maria was also charged with fraud for continuing to receive welfare benefits for Aaliyah long after her death. Hmm, does that sound familiar, receiving state benefits for a child who is missing or deceased? Reminds me a little bit of a Philadelphia case in the news right now. Grace Packer's adoptive mother cashed $3,600 worth of Social Security benefits that were intended for Grace, but she never told the benefits administrator her child was missing. This is like history repeating itself. Okay, back to Parents of the Year, Maria and Charles Davis. Once they learned their older children had turned on them, they split town. They left West Philadelphia with their younger children, and for a while they were possibly hiding out in New York. And the stories that Amira and Malcolm told weren't just about Aaliyah's death. There were stories of their own experiences that were like something out of a horror movie, Malcolm had been stabbed by his mother for burning food, and he'd been beat in the head with cans. There were frequent beatings. There were days when they weren't allowed to eat, and so much worse that I just can't even share. They also told police of the events that led up to Aaliyah's beating. She'd had an accident just as the family was getting ready to sit down and watch the Dukes of Hazard on a Friday night. Aaliyah had an accident and needed help changing her clothes and washing up. That's something that happens to almost every child, even after years of potty training, even if it just happens occasionally. And instead of someone wiping her tears, telling her it would be okay, and reminding her that she has to pay attention to the signals her body sends, letting her know when it's time to use the bathroom, getting her fresh clothes, helping her get clean, she was beaten to death for having an accident. And the real tragedy here is that Philadelphia's Department of Human Services knew Maria had issues with neglect and child endangerment. They first connected with Maria Davis in 1974, seven years before Aaliyah was found murdered, when Maria was charged with second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter in connection with the death of her 17-month-old son, Saeed. Maria admitted hitting Saeed, which ultimately led to his death. She was sentenced to eight years probation, so technically... She was still on probation for the death of one child when she and her husband were responsible for causing the death of another child. What the actual fuck? Okay, I'm feeling judgmental because I know nothing about being a caseworker for children and families. Everything I hear is that it's a difficult job. There aren't enough caseworkers to handle the number of children and families. There isn't enough time in the day for all of the necessary home visits and surprise visits and paperwork and processing. Yet when I researched Aaliyah's story, I was furious. Her mother had already killed one child. So this is a home that, in my opinion at least, should have been high on the radar for regular visits, surprise visits, especially while the parent was on probation for child abuse. The Davis family had numerous documented incidents of child neglect or abuse, one, in fact, that even resulted in a hospital visit for Malcolm. So there were medical records proving the abuse. Why was no one paying attention to this family? Not even the Department of Human Services noticed that a child was missing when they visited the Davis home. 
This system failed the Davis children, and most of all, it failed Aaliyah. Finally, on May 26, 1988, the FBI caught up with Maria and Charles Fox. They were arrested in Newport News, Virginia, and extradited back to Philadelphia to stand trial for Aaliyah's murder. Plus, they racked up federal charges of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. So that's where the FBI came in. Charles Fox was charged with first-degree murder, and Aaliyah's mother was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just like in the case of Jarrell Willis, Maria admitted to being in the house at the time of her daughter's death, but she denied any participation in the actual beating. I wonder if Jarrell Willis's mother, Alicia Robinson, actually read up on this case before she was arrested, because her story sounds an awful lot like Maria Fox's defense. And if you really want to hear something pathetic, Maria Fox's defense attorney argued that she was merely guilty of not properly burying an individual. Yeah, you heard me right. So, allowing your husband to beat your child to death, let the body linger in the house for a few days to make sure that she is indeed dead, then let him dispose of your child in a trunk in a vacant lot amounts to simply not properly burying an individual. Yeah, I want to throat punch that asshole too. As a result of the trials, Aaliyah's older brother and sister, Malcolm and Amira, were placed in a foster home for abused children, and their younger half-siblings were sent to live with relatives. I hate that our city has cases called the girl in the trunk and the boy in the bag. It sickens me to learn that in so many cases of children's death, it's at the hand of their parents. And if I think about it too long and too hard, it breaks me because I start to picture things through the eyes of those little four and five-year-old children, looking at mommy, thinking this is the person who loves me most of all. This is the person who will always protect and care for me. And I imagine their little voices crying, why, or stop, or please. Besides these two cases, Philadelphia has another more famous story of an abandoned child, the boy in the box. Unlike Jarrell and Aaliyah, the little boy abandoned in the woods in Fox Chase in a bassinet box back in 1956 is still an unsolved murder so we don't yet know his name. But his story is a story for another day. If you're a parent, hug your kids as often as possible. I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's so important. If you don't have kids of your own, you might have nieces and nephews or godchildren or the children of friends that are like your own children. Hug them extra tight and often. Let them know you would step in front of a bus to keep them safe and never do anything to hurt them. They will probably look at you like you're mental, but they deserve to hear that on a regular basis. And who cares if they think you're mental? When we were kids, we thought all grown-ups were mental, so now it's our turn. That's it from me for this episode. Ciao for now, Twisters.